This is Podkit, episode 53, Cash the Whole Farm, on Sunday, November 24th, 2019. And now, in my old age. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersett. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk53. Well, we did it again, guys. It's been another two months. Whew. Ten well, flies. We're, yeah, we're back. But on the I mean, on the bright side, there's more to talk about. All this content, things have happened in our niche world of Apple and web development. Yeah, I mean, those <laughs> things don't overlap whatsoever, so it's a good thing we have something to talk about. Totally. Well, we should talk about the most important thing first, which is, what is it? The 16-inch MacBook Pro. That's right. Oh, finally. Ooh. All of our dreams and wishes have been answered after, I don't know, like three and a half years of agony. Something like that. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about it. So it's a we're referring to it as the 16-inch MacBook Pro, but when you actually look at the screen, you can't tell that the screen size is any bigger than it used to be. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, like, internally what apple does to think like why did that why was the screen change so minimal i don't know well i think didn't they 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 decreased the bezel size a little bit and then increased the case size just a little bit so it is 16 inch but it doesn't look much larger because it isn't much larger yeah it's 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 uh completely unnoticeable yes perfect um, more importantly than the screen size, of course, uh, not the keyboard. Nope, nope. It's the same price that it used to be. So they did not do what I suspected, which was making an entirely new SKU and making the MacBook Pro Pro and making the base model be $3,000. They did not do that. They could That's have, good. but they didn't. And uh, with those same priced models, the baseline configurations have been updated as well. So you can now get a good or and or good enough gpu uh but more interestingly and importantly for bulk purchases the models will no longer come with 256 gigs of storage instead they'll be coming with 512 and one terabyte nice we finally caught up to hard drives from like 10 years ago (laughs) and and so it's an extremely important thing that apple's actually shipping baseline SKUs with appropriate amounts of storage because when large companies order Max for development teams, they don't often BTO any of those products because they're not usually, it's not something you can do with, with the bulk ordering system. So that's fine, but what that meant was computers were coming into these businesses that were using Docker and NPM and who knows what other very large file storage space intensive uses, usages. Mm-hmm. And they were getting crushed under the 256 gig spec. Yeah. And not only are these baselines higher, but you can upgrade them to 8 terabytes of solid state storage. So Jeez. get on that. For a low, low price of a million dollars. Well, I think I it's think... like 2500 for the SSD upgrade, which yeah, is so, yeah, so much less than it used to be from Apple totally. you know, a couple of years ago. Somebody spec'd the most, you know, they, they just clicked the most expensive BTO options, and it only came out to like six sixty five hundred, so it's actually not that bad. I mean, yeah, that's a lot like, of money, but well, I mean, it's a lot of yeah. money, but I mean, you know, like there's an iMac Pro and there's now the new Mac Pro, which should be coming out here any day now. So, like, that's not too bad. Why would you get that though when you could just get like three quarters of a Pro Display Max XDR Pro? Pro HD. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm. I think there's a hole in that plan. That's true. You could also you could also just get the stand six and a half times. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, and of course, the most important thing about this new computer is the new keyboard. Yeah, which has an escape key. I'm told. Yes, a physical, hardware escape physical key. Physical escape key. Uh, I've actually been programming in Vim lately uh, because somebody turned on. Uh, Vim mode in my VS Code, <laughs> and I can't escape. <laughs> Someone did. <laughs> and uh, escape is very important to have. Uh, I actually went to an Apple store a few days ago uh, and tried one of these new keyboards, 
And it does feel very similar to the Magic Keyboard that I have, but it also still feels somewhat similar to the Butterfly. It's a very solid key, unlike sort of the wiggly keys that the uh, 2013 and 15 models had. It's a little bit more stable. Yeah, I would say so. Interesting. But it actually has travel. Like, you press it and you're actually going down. Well, it has it has one millimeter of travel instead of 0.55 millimeters of travel. It's, it's it's for some reason that's a lot. Yeah, it's almost double. Yeah, I love my Magic Keyboard, so this sounds like a like a cool keyboard. I haven't tried tried it yet, but uh, if it's anything like the Magic Keyboard, I am happy. So one thing I miss, so I use the Magic Keyboard at home in my, at my uh, work desk, and when I'm at mm-hmm. work, I just use the built-in laptop's keyboard. What I miss when I'm at home, I have my laptop on a little uh, like riser stand, and what uh-huh. I miss about the keyboard is that it's not backlit. And I wish Apple sold the backlit backlit uh, Magic Keyboard because I could actually see it then. Of course, right. if they did, it would cost one billion dollars. Right, and then you could get so many MacBooks exactly at eight terabytes for that. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I agree with you, Ryan. A backlit Magic Keyboard is, like, that would be the keyboard to beat all keyboards in my eyes. I use this backlit mechanical keyboard, but it's so noisy, and it's, like, I want a, I want a Magic Keyboard. I've debated just buying one and getting rid of this mechanical one just because they're so much smaller and lighter and flatter and easier to type on. Well, the other thing that I wish is the black or dark-themed Magic Keyboard only comes in full layout i really wanted a 10 key less one yeah yeah that's a bummer too so many needs apple yes well maybe they'll release something new with a new mac pro we'll see uh, i think somebody somebody was uh showing leaked pictures of a new theme for the keyboards and peripheral products so it would be dark but the metal would be or like the keys would be dark but the metal would be like uh uh, steel color, the normal aluminum kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So like like a keyboard on a MacBook, for example. Kind of. Yes. Also, the new MacBook Pro keyboard has an inverted T arrow keys, so you can feel the arrow keys again instead of just mashing the bottom right and hoping you make it. <laughs> Which is also important for Vim users. So I agree. Definitely. Yeah. So I I, I didn't buy one yet. I probably will wait until I need one. Again, later, soon. Uh, but uh, hopefully, like, in the in the near future, all of the uh, stores will have these, and you just go in and buy one and enjoy a real computer for a change. <laughs> nice. I would say, for those of us interested in purchasing Magic Keyboards, my pro tip slash life hack is to go to the, uh, what do they call it, M-Tech uh, store on the U of M campus because they often sell open box magic keyboards that basically come from professors who got a magic keyboard with their iMac and they're like, oh, screw this. This is terrible. I need something with a number pad and I want it to have a wire. Um, and uh, so they just take those back and sell them for like 25 bucks off. Um, so, you know. If you need one of those, that's a good place to get them. That is a great pro tip. Good to know. And you don't even have to be a U of M student to shop there. All right. If either of you are there and you see one, just buy a keyboard and tell (laughs) me about it after the fact because I will pay you for it. Perfect. 100%. 100%. All right. On on another note, Ryan, I heard you're uh, doing some reading. You bet I am. So I started uh, with a good friend of the show, Zach, a book club where we work, and um, we are reading uh, the book recommendation that Brandon had about, I don't know, seven months ago, because it just came out (laughs) earlier this month in November, I believe. And um, it is the Pragmatic Programmer 20th Anniversary Edition. And uh, basically, the way that we've structured the book club is we read a chapter a week, and then on a Thursday afternoon, kind of after work, we'll go down to the lobby and uh, go to the little coffee shop that's built into the into the building and get coffee and then talk about the book for an hour. And it's really fun. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting, too, because some of us are, you know, sort of 
it's sort of strange because the people can be in the industry for 20 years but not totally be like a senior developer but people who've been in the industry for three years can be what they put in quotes as senior developer and then hey that's me <laughs> right exactly <laughs> that's probably all three of us here at this point yeah um and it's interesting because we also have a bunch of juniors on the team and they haven't had experience with some of the topics in the book yet and you know, all of us senior-like people are all nodding our heads and saying, yeah, you'll get there one day, you kids. And then <laughs> <laughs> and then all the, all of the junior devs are, you know, just kind of like, okay, like I get what it, the book is saying, but I just, it hasn't happened to me yet. So it's been really interesting to kind of discuss some of the, the, the aspects that have been talked about so far. Cool. Yeah, I'd I'd like to get into reading more. Like, uh, I was doing really well earlier this year. Not really like uh, programming related stuff in that example, but I, I bought that book that you were talking about. You know, this summer, and I yes. haven't even opened it yet. But <laughs> the idea is there. I have it for when I do eventually want to read a book again. <laughs> for sure, I would say it actually is a little bit easier to read a book uh, with a group of people because you're expected to read a chapter and the chapters of maybe like 30 to 40 pages and you know it's not a it's not like a novel it's not like a school book it's it's a book full of like source code and like a page doesn't equal a page it's a little bit lighter yeah. than that and then it gives you totally. motivation too to keep going well and you actually get to talk about it after yeah mm -hmm. uh, i will make another note like everybody should be doing this kind of stuff um and if if you can't personally find time during the workday to do some reading because, you know, you're actually busy working. That's fine. But you should be doing some reading in your personal time. And, like, if you're do, just doing a chapter a week and a book maybe has, like, 10, 10 to 15 chapters, like, okay, well, you can still do three or four books a year. Like, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Um, mm -hmm. And having some formal... Eh, formal education sounds complicated. But having some book knowledge is useful. Uh, especially when somebody asks you, like, hey, read anything good lately? Uh, and then the other thing I'll say is your your employer should be paying for your books like this. You get to keep the knowledge. They get to keep the book. It's a fair trade. So I was going to ask, I know I know we kind of wrapped a little bit uh, about this, but how what, what chapters have you read so far? And out of those discussions, has there been anything that's kind of been uh, stuck out or has been particularly applicable to the stuff that you all have been working on. You bet. At company name. Yes, at company name that may or may not start with a C. Yeah. Um, well, company name starts with a C. I so know. See, it's very coincidental. Um, so you know, we 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 kind of looked at the first chapter a couple weeks ago, and uh, it was kind of our test run chapter. So, like, mm. who wants to participate? Well, find out if you like the book first, and then come to come to class. Yep. Um, and so we, we really paid attention to the stone soup and boiled frogs section because yep. uh, what we do, uh, like I'm a consultant, for example, and what we do is we bring people together who weren't together and we use all of their individual subsections of knowledge to go and create an outcome that wasn't available before. Mm -hmm. And so that that resonates pretty strongly with a lot of us. The other thing that I like is the uh, communication section, of course, within the first chapter. You know, also as a consultant, we have to talk a lot. Also as a podcaster, we have to talk a lot. Not every engineer, and you may have heard about this, likes to talk or knows how to talk mm -hmm. well. And it's an important thing to be able to do. Um, in the second section, we kind of split up the reading. We wanted to actually uh, cover tracer bullets and prototypes last week, and then this week we'll talk about some of the uh, other stuff. You know, it's a short mm -hmm. week, so splitting it up makes sense in this case. So we do a lot of prototypes um, at company name, and those prototypes are really important because they define whether or not certain ideas are valuable and worth continuing. Mm -hmm. But there's also this concept of a tracer bullet, which is, in the book's opinion, sort of a prototype, but it's more structured than that, and it's a code that you don't intend to throw out. And I guess when I read the book the first time, nobody had the book yet, and then now we're reading it as a group, and I still don't necessarily agree with the concept the book is portraying about tracer bullets. Mm -hmm. I think they are 
an imaginary concept relative to the way I work. I work that way. Like, code that I write after I've thought about it is code I intend to keep. And then I'm, but I'm prototyping it in the sense that if it doesn't work, I'm not going to keep it. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. And I feel like there's, there's a lot of stuff like that, that very much can be, can change depending on your, like, job function or the culture of your company, kind of like you said. Absolutely. Because, like, when, when you're just trying to figure out whether you want to do something at all, like you said, it's like, that's a little bit of a different thing where, whereas, like, I think you're right that from almost from that perspective, it's it's written from this notion of like, well, you know, it's already been decided that we're going to do this. The prototyping is just figuring out what the what the right way to go about it is. Almost, it is is is, is almost what it what it feels like the angle is, or you, you, maybe that's a little bit too no, restrictive. I, no, but like, I think so. So, like you, you've you've probably seen the. Um the scrum circle like uh if, yep. you, if you do a google image search and you you type in scrum you'll see this sort of line and then there's a circle in the line that's kind of what i think of tracer bullets and prototypes are the totally. the line is the tracer bullet and the prototype is the little circle that that loops around and then continues the line because I, I intend to keep the code I write, and I intend to write sections of code so that I don't have to write the whole system or large uh-huh. verticals of the system all at once. But there are pieces that I will rewrite and iterate on individually. Um, so those two sections uh, so far have been the ones that I personally have sort of like, eh, maybe the book doesn't totally know what it's talking about in this regard. Yeah, I gotcha. Yep. Well, right on. No, it's interesting stuff, and I'll of course love to hear what what y'all think about that as uh, as the book club progresses. Yes, I, I I really like that book, and I I've found it to be really applicable, uh, especially as I've gone freelance. Because yep. like you know, it's it's harder to get that to absorb that kind of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and Pragmatic Programmer is a good source of like, um, you know, like that that kind of professional, uh. It's kind of like a like a like a senior engineer, like an engineer mentor in a box in a lot of ways, well, right? Yes, like, exactly. Um, and and it's really hard to get. I've been thinking about that a lot. It's really hard to find that these days. Totally, absolutely, it is absolutely, especially like, um, you know, like I I have a a lot of really great mentors in, um, both in like contracting and freelancing circles and in like creative tech circles and stuff like that. But like you said, there's not really um, you know, it's, it's often hard to find that kind of knowledge in the wild these days. And you have to really, uh, like, like you said, that's kind of something that almost best comes from, from a book. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for a, a, a confusing tree or, a, a beautiful, a beautiful mind. Uh, what was the name of the book? Uh, <laughs> let me pull it up here real quick. Which, which one? Uh, questionable shape. Uh, the one that with the cool the stripe guy made. Oh, the elegant puzzle. Elegant puzzle. There we go. Yeah, figured it out. Interesting um, tree. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting tree. That's a good. That's a. I've I've really enjoyed it. It's my it's my read on flights book. I see. Which is which is silly. I know. I probably won't be managing anybody anytime soon. But it's interesting to to think those thoughts. Right. Like you said, and I think it's yes. interesting to take those experiences of somebody who's who's been a manager at companies like Uber and Stripe and I don't know. I think the guy mentioned he worked at Yahoo for a little while, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, it's 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 interesting to think those thoughts, um, even if maybe like I won't be in that professional situation for quite quite some time, um, if at all, because it's. Uh, it's good to know where people's heads are at when they're encountering these situations. If, if you have to interact with them and stuff like that. So yeah, for sure. I, I was just reading something and somebody brought up the term of shadow management where you are mm-hmm. not the manager, but you act as if you were, but you don't do the manager things with the title anymore. And, right. and it's, it's uh, kind of what I do basically. And it's, it's a very interesting concept. Hey, um, did you guys want to talk about that thing that happened a while ago that none of us went to? You mean ReactConf? Yeah, ReactConf. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get a ticket. It's a bummer. Uh this was what, end of end of October, like a month ago now, I think? Yeah, October twenty fifth, twenty sixth, I think. 
Uh, so this is what two days of of talks in outside of Las Vegas. So this is React Conf, the the one put on by Facebook. Exactly, it's hosted by them, and that means it's um, often the place where they talk about super special secret things. Yeah, um, I watched a few of the talks. Um, they had an opening keynote that was kind of split between two of the managers on the React teams. Um, I linked one here by uh, Yuzi who talked about uh, like a high level uh, what concurrent mode will bring to the developer and user experience and talked about um, server-side rendering and their, um, do they call it time slicing or it where sounds, they can do like right. partial hydration or something. It was pretty cool. Um, it sounds like a great use for the new Facebook.com and I haven't looked into much about concurrent mode beyond that. From yeah. What I've seen in the talks and a little on Twitter, but I, I haven't, I, so, you know, like, a year ago, we got uh, Hooks, revolutionized React development, I'll tell you that. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, yeah. And then the February before that, we kind of didn't get a React Conf, but that was just a, an event for some reason, I guess. And that's kind of when we were exposed to suspense and concurrent mode for the first time. But then, you know, it's it's been kind of a slow development cycle to get concurrent mode and suspense to the masses Mm -hmm. yeah i think they've been working through a bunch of examples and problems and things at facebook um i heard on react podcast this week i believe it was brian vaughn who was being who was the guest on the show and mentioned like i just get little hints that like concurrent mode is really designed to only be used with hooks not class components at all particularly not the legacy lifecycle methods um i'm okay with that doesn't bother me at all. And yeah, that's that seems fine. Now it's funny cuz I I still see hooks code not being used in some situations in real life and it's like no, you got to stop that. Yeah, I haven't I haven't written a class component once since hooks came out. Right, I haven't either and I don't know how to anymore and it's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> uh let's see what other talks did you like, Brian? I really liked the building a custom react renderer by Sophie Alpert. Uh she went into kind of building a mini React DOM, so progressively implemented some of the features and interfaces in the library so that you could create components and then you could delete components and you could update components. Uh, and so that was that was pretty cool to see just how it how it works. Um, so that was that was fun. I've always kind of wondered how how do renderers actually work and it seems pretty straightforward and pluggable. Now there are a bunch of like side effects and things that you have to deal with um unique to each platform but yeah hooking into the reconciler seems pretty nice hooking into it (laughs) (laughs) not even on purpose (laughs) nope another talk that i didn't watch from react conf but i watched at react rally was is react translated yet by nat allison great talk about translating the react.js docs on their website and creating a platform for managing the translations and deploying them and linking them and having it all kind of be compatible with each other. That's cool. I watched a talk from Ashley Watkins, who was working on the new Facebook website itself. And it is sort of a talk on, uh, you know, using concurrent mode, um, and, uh, relay, which is sort of their first implementation of a, concurrent mode suspense compliant data fetcher and they were also talking about uh some of the new css and js and some of the fa- what what they're calling phased code downloads which is special secret code for uh what, what split code modules basically code, code splitting yeah. yeah exactly so it's really cool there's a lot of cool stuff that they they're able to do with some of the new concurrent mode aspects especially with some of their new uh phased code downloading uh like what does it mean to have the ui hang out for a while while itself is downloading more stuff to render itself like it's (laughs) very strange but also very fascinating yeah kind of how i understand concurrent mode and what it's supposed to help with is it kind of batches the what used to be a waterfall of downloading chunks, downloading data to download more chunks, to download more data, et cetera, to bubbling up to, you know, suspense boundaries. So you can show like one kind of area wide 
uh, stuff is coming, loading indicator or something, and then right. the rest can kind of be downloaded. And so you you lift your data fetching up a layer so you can fetch that when you want to. Um, so you kind of fetch that when you fetch the components that will eventually render that data. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, still uh, extraordinarily complicated at this time. I and like we said earlier, like it's not totally clear how to use concurrent mode and suspense very well easily today. It's not like you can just get started like it was with hooks. Like there's some more depth and planning that is necessary. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it develops over the next few months or a year. Um, yeah, and I think it'll, especially at the beginning, it'll be very much a very small amount of users will or develop applications will opt into it. Right. And we'll have to see what um, what is is what is and is not compatible with it as well. Um, a couple of other interesting notes from React Conf. Uh, version 17 of React did not come out. Oh. No, it so, did not. But we got 16.11 and 16.12 this right. fall with just some minor bug fixes. So. And they also changed their um, alpha build naming convention. Uh, experimental builds won't have version numbers anymore, so you you won't get to know what they're related to. Random. Mm. Um, so maybe we'll see. Like maybe seventeen is still still a ways off. Maybe that's a late next year kind of thing. We'll see. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is uh, Dan Abramov recently has been tweeting about um, sort of mixing uh, server side and client side tech uh, for further integration. And uh, that's always a spooky thing, so we'll see what that means in the long term. Yeah. It's an interesting new world out there. All right, for something completely different, um, the Redux docs have been getting a lot of attention lately, um, and they're uh, releasing a new style guide page that kind of talks about a lot of best practices that the Redux team recommends you use, and that um, I think some common patterns that the community at large has been using as well. So some of these are, um, they list them in three priorities, A, B, and C, essential, strongly recommended, and recommended. Um, and some of the essential ones are like, do not mutate state. Um, that's kind of been described in their docs already, I think. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a generally known thing about um, Redux. Yep, and they um, suggest that you can use tools like Redux Immutable State Invariant or Immer to avoid mutating that state um, if you don't implement it all by your hand all by hand reducers must not have side effects so these are things like using date.now or math.random inside of a reducer oh I'm guilty yeah I think I do some date.now stuff yep I'm, I'm totally guilty of that and I don't I don't mind doing that because I mean it was either going to come from the action or it was going to come from the reducer so I, it doesn't matter to me yeah, what it, what it breaks is like time traveling of going through your state if you're calling reducers again. I never do that. To update? No. But the, the Redux dev tools let you do that, and it's kind of weird to see if you have parts of your application that are solely uh, controlled through Redux. It's About kind of 90% fun. of the time, I forget the Redux dev tools even exist, so I'm okay with that. Now, the next one I think is really interesting. Do not put non-serializable values in state or actions. Hmm. I don't think I've ever done that, so that seems okay to me. What about you, Brandon? Like, I'm I'm trying to think of a situation where it would happen, like a moment JS object, maybe that's not written out to something serializable, because mm-hmm. moment in in and of itself isn't like a moment object isn't in and of itself serializable. You'd want to do like a value of or something like that, right? Two string ISO or value of, yeah, yeah. So. I've actually been in a set of talks recently at a uh, company name, and one of the things that came up was actually storing non-serializable values in local component state and or in the store. And we had this long discussion about why this is a terrible idea. And mm. I, I thought it was very interesting to now see this written here because I agree with it. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of a situation where I have – done that i don't know that i have so some some people will like think it's clever and or useful to store a function in 
uh, a local component state. Uh, that's spooky to me. Now, it's less yeah. spooky there because you never really dump a component state to a serialized format. But a store is, by definition, almost certainly going to get serialized in some way or another. All right. Yeah, it would make Redux persist. Break. Have a terrible time. It would explode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, one thing that's interesting about that is it doesn't say why you shouldn't do that. I mean, I guess it just says here that Redux dev tools will explode, but I feel like there should be a more uh, important underlying reason. Right. But, yeah. Uh, only one Redux store per app. I mean, I guess that's fine, but, you know, uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, we'll talk about the Redux toolkit here in a minute, um, and we'll see what you guys think about it. Uh, Immer for writing immutable updates. I uh, don't want to use yet another layer of indirection in my code, to be honest. Mm. What do you guys think? Yeah, I have not used Immer. Um, I find that a lot of the, the docs for Redux and React Redux particularly too is it's like use use this library for this, this library for that, and you're you're pulling in a ton of tooling. And conceptually I I agree with all of it and it makes sense, but it seems like a lot of overhead. And my application that I work on at work is it uses Redux, but not you know, not everything in the app uses it. So it's not a like one hundred percent Redux app. There's some like global stuff that does. But I feel like the use cases aren't quite strong enough to warrant all of these extra libraries and building your own immutable reducer case returns are is like it's that's doable so i don't need to use immer for that i feel right yeah i i there i was talking with brandon um before the show started would you should listen to our fringe today it was actually super good really great react content in the fringe today uh and we were talking about immer and there's actually an app at work that I didn't develop, but it was watching being developed, and that team was using Immer. And I feel like there's a lot of extra code that had to be written because Immer was involved, and maybe it stands out to me because I'm so unfamiliar with Immer and that code base. But on the other hand, I think if you have never used Immer before and you're coming to that code base, you're going to be sort of shell-shocked by how much stuff there is suddenly that you never used to do before. So right. in a in a reducer you would never do like state dot thing dot x equals five because you would never do an equals you would have to replace thing and then replace x with a five and you know like it's a lot more work in the old way but it's something you are used to and that and the quote old way is how it sh- like that shows you that it should be immutable you should be returning new references to objects and things like that if if that reducer state is changing at all and so it's a little interesting yeah it's very strange okay let's just speed down here through the list uh put as much logic in reducers as possible that's that's interesting i by the way these are the strongly recommended now the priority b rules right right um oh there's a detailed explanation but oh i'm gonna have to come back and reread this now yeah, um, right? I didn't realize that <laughs> detailed explanation either. Yeah. So I guess that's cool. Reducers should own the state shape. Yes, I, I do agree with that. Um, treat reducers as state machines. I very much agree with that. Uh, yep. Normalize complex in nested relational state. That's too hard to read right now. I'll come back later. Meaningful action names. Yes, I agree. I actually... Can we go back to normalize com- complex nested and relational state real quick? Because yes. I have some opinions on this in relation to the draft state item. You you, you um, talk about that one. It was too hard for me. So the, the way that I've used Redux most frequently is you have kind of almost either per concept reducers or in some situations, there's like a reducer of... That, that kind of just holds information about all of your resources. Mm-hmm. I'm, t- I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of like a good way to explain that, but like w- under this item, they talk about like, oh, you know, uh, when you get data from an API, you want to store it in a way that allows you to look things up by their ID and update a single item, et cetera, et cetera. But the way that I had the most luck with this, and this ties back to why I don't think Immer is super compelling to me. I think it's an interesting idea, but I don't think using Immer for in a reducer makes a lot of sense for me. Because usually what I do is for something like this, when I'm going to make when I'm going to like make changes to a thing, right? Or um, you know, like for example, if you're if you're if you have like a product 
experience and it's like, oh, tap this category, then tap this subcategory, then pick this item out of a list and customize it. And then when you do, when, when you submit that, then that goes back through and hits the store. Um, when you have like a normalized, like when you have a normalized store where everything is always, you know, maybe you want to keep it in sync with the server, maybe you don't, but you have like the source of truth for all that stuff. And I think that's why Immer always kind of messes with me a little bit is because almost always when I commit that state, I want to kick off a side effect, which you can't do in a reducer. Right. Um, And so in that sense, I almost always have a separate reducer that tracks the the draft state of something. Mm -hmm. And then eventually when that draft is locked in or published or whatever, it ends up uh, triggering something, some side effects and async action. And then eventually that'll update the normalized store. So I think like maybe those two things felt a little bit in conflict to me um, because like I would almost never want to update that client side. I almost always, or, you know, for the use case I'm thinking, I'd almost never want to update that client side. I'd almost always want it to come back to me from the server. And then I would just use that to update and patch what is like shadowed from that, which goes back to Redux persist and everything like that. So yeah, I don't know. I think those things are a little bit in conflict in this, but um, for the most part, if you don't have everything in uh, basically in objects by ID so that you can pull them out really quickly, then you're just kind of in for a rough time in terms of like quote unquote querying your Redux store like you would a database. Right, for sure. Yeah, uh, we we had an, an app. Uh, it was our chicken app from a couple years ago. And ah, uh, yes. You know, we uh, we were trying to optimize uh, out as much as possible all of the uh, Ajax requests that were going on because. Mm-hmm. We had to have full offline capabilities, so we needed to cache the entire farm and all of the farm's houses and all of the farm's flocks and all of the houses' chickens and so on. Uh, and what we did originally was we built out entire, like, full full comprehensive REST endpoints for it to all cobble together. And it would basically normalize per endpoint internally. Uh-huh. But then there was, you know, a thousand Ajax requests going off, and that was too many. So we we condensed it basically down. We'll we'll make one call per per something. I think it was either farm or per farmhouse. So we got it down from five hundred to like five. So that was great. Mm. But what was now coming down over the wire was all this stuff that needed to be split back out into its own homes. And right. we wanted to reuse the same reducer, so we had to do all this very particular like manualization effort ourselves. That sounds like um, another one of the strongly recommended things, which is allow many reducers to respond to the same action. Yeah, just saw that one too. That's a pattern that I've used a little bit in my app. Um, there's some like application wide stuff like user impersonation that goes on, so you want to like wipe all your reducers out. I actually have a f- function that wraps some reducers that watches those and then re- calls the reducer with undefined for the state, so it just returns the initial state. So I kind of wrap some reducers that deal with user stuff um, or like data to a user so we can just wrap a reducer with something and have it wipe it all clean on the associated actions. To bring it back to something we were talking about in the fringe, that's probably where I'd want to, I almost want to use X state to, to model this stuff. And I'll tell you why, because when I have multiple reducers responding to the same action, it all of a sudden gets super annoying to debug uh, or it can get super annoying to debug, or you can introduce super terrible, subtle bugs if you're uh, anticipating uh, that uh, uh, an action will have certain actions. But it also, like, I, I almost, I almost would sometimes it 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 is almost indistinguishable from a side effect, even though it's literally not a side effect or an asynchronous effect of a Redux store to do something like that. But if you have an action that's like um, like in your in your case, Brian, when when your action is like log somebody out, that, that not that that's a great action name on on my part, but like <laughs> when you have an action that logs somebody out, you might do that across multiple reducers, sure. But like uh, if you have something where it's like add product to cart and it adds the products of the cart, and then also uh, increments 
something in your analytics store, which might make sense. But if it does, if it does some other thing, maybe this is just a problem of like factoring it appropriately so that generally speaking, these things are things that feel like they belong under a certain action and naming properly. But I feel like that's still really difficult. Uh, but where this is kind of coming from is like, there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways that that can get gnarly really quickly. I feel like, even though I, I understand that that's a, a, a cool tool to have in the toolbox, but like, man, I want, I want to have a state machine chart that can show me how, how all that's supposed to work. Otherwise, otherwise it gets tricky. Yeah. When you have many reducers responding to actions, you can start losing sense of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's, it's a really good pattern, but you have to be diligent about, okay, I need to remember to add this action handling to all of these reducers or else we're going to be leaking data across user sessions or something. Um, which is why I wrote a, f a function that just wraps reducer functions. So mm -hmm. in the like create store call, so there's one place to do it for everything and it's really simple. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's a good idea. That makes sense. There was a project I worked on, uh, as a bug fixer for a little bit. And, uh, the, the way that that project's reducers worked out was um, there were asynchronous thunks that would do some stuff, but then there were dynamic actions mm. that would um, come down come down through you know those dynam those those async thunks, and the dynamic actions would basically change their action type based on who knows what other arbitrary stuff. And it was extra just an extraordinary mess of having too many reducers do too many different things, and the action types were dynamic, so like you just never knew what was going on. Like you couldn't search for the string, the the the, the action type. You had to search for a thing that made the string, and it was just a disaster. So you you really do have to be really careful when you have multiple reducers firing at once based on the same data, and then then you also have to like actually write tests for that because most people would assume that it's probably not necessarily intended behavior. All right, let's see some more stuff. Model actions as events, not setters. Don't say like, you know, set username, say, you know, like user, user logged in or something. And then that have things handle that action versus it's kind of like a um, responding to events versus like pushing set calls around. It's just a, mindset because yeah. you, you you handle your actions i'm i'm guilty i was just gonna say another common thing that that's been really frustrating is when like folks will basically create a reducer and either have like setters for each individual field uh, uh right like basically getters and setters for each individual field as actions um or uh they will have one setter for the entire reducer uh or my favorite which is both <laughs> folks will make you know actions that do just 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 uh you know sometimes we'll edit just certain fields and other times we'll edit the entire uh the entire state um it's really frustrating because you, then your actions are meaningless and they're not grouped by what you actually want it to do so i think this is a reasonable point to have that describes it perfectly that is tied in very closely with right meaningful action names. Yes, let's see what else. Avoid dispatching many actions sequentially. I think that's important because those updates are are there. And if you have a bunch of actions that are all dispatched at like the same time, you should probably have one action and handle it in um, several different reducers or uh, reconsider your reducer logic so you don't need so many actions. The, the one I found here in priority C was write action types as domain slash event. And, uh, you know, everybody was always taught in Redux land to use, like, uh, as they describe it here, screaming snake case. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I've, i it's interesting that they say that here because in, uh, what is that thing called? React Native with um, React Native Router Flux, the router that we use. Yeah. Uh, you have to have, you know, it, it's not like action types, but you have to have uh, basically like screen slugs. And I hated how the screen slugs were always shown in that system as snake case 
screaming. Uh, so what I would always do was do like screen type, and then you know what the screen was for. So like uh, off login, off sign out, uh, farm chickens and like you know it worked out really well and here here we are back in redux land doing the same thing with the data layer okay yeah that makes sense yeah some of some of my actions are very long because you know they're all like start demo impersonation it that's like 30 characters long and it gets very difficult to like figure out what's what but when you use action creators which i think is in one of these recommended things somewhere you don't really have to worry about what they're called. You just see them in DevTools, I guess. Right. I also find it kind of interesting that um, they recommend thunks by default uh, for middleware, What kind of brings me back up to this notion of like not dispatching actions uh, in sequence. I guess it's a little different because generally speaking, when you're, when you're using thunks to do any sort of side effect or async logic, um, usually you're like, Make an HTTP request. Wait for it to come back. Do something with that, and 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 dispatch that as an action. Then do something else. You know, but but takes time or talks to an external service or something like that, and do something with that result. And then, if I, th- I think I've discussed quite a bit um, on the show over the years, just kind of how wacky um, the effect libraries for re- Redux I've I've found them to be. Um, I, I think I agree with the notion that thunks are probably still the way to go, but man, for so many things, sagas were necessary. Like they even call it out here for anything that look, has to like quote unquote look like a background thread um, that's not attached to any particular component, but needs to be running all the time and responding to actions almost like a reducer would, but as essentially a service of its own, really. You have to use something like saga or, or Redux observable. Yeah, I really like Redux Saga's pattern for that. Things like take latest or take every or take first or or initial mm-hmm. or whatever they call it. That that kind of asynchronous handling is really nice, but that library feels very heavy because you're you're not just shipping the Saga library, but like polyfills for generators. Um and then in addition, you have with Redux Observable, you're using that library plus all of RxJS, which is quite large as well. So, I've never used yeah. Redux Thunk actually. I've used Redux observable and a lot more of Redux Saga. So interesting. We should we should we should talk about Redux Saga at some point. It's been a year or so since I've been really deep into that, but um, it's uh, I th- I think it's probably changed quite a bit, and hopefully there's some better guardrails around it now because we were running into some really weird crap. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's whip through these last couple here quick. Uh, use static typing. Great, we all like that. Use the Redux DevTools extension for debugging. I agree with that. It's it's cool. It shows you what things were changed when certain actions were fired. Um, and then use selector multiple f- times in function components. Um, so this um, says, when retrieving data using the use selector hook, prefer calling use selector many times and retrieving smaller m- amounts of data instead of having a single larger use selector call that returns multiple results in an object. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've been using uSelector a ton and just getting rid of Connect and all the extra interfaces that that brings along. And code is getting smaller. And now I, we have, um, we structure our reducers in like areas. So we might have a couple, so we have a reducers folder. And then in there, there's a couple of like other directories that have a few reducers in each. And then inside of one of those folders, there's a selectors file that just has a bunch of arrow functions that just take in state and return a value or a small computed slice or something. Yep, that's what I'm doing too. All right, I think that's lots of Redux talk, and that's great. There, There's even more Priority C stuff, but those are the big things. Um, I really like this because it really pushes the like best practices with Redux, and um, these are a lot of... This style guide is a lot of a lot of best practices that have been floating around but never really formalized in the Redux docs in this way. A lot of what they say is scattered throughout, but this kind of brings it all front and center, and I really like that. Yep, I agree. Um, and all this work has been done by the wonderful Mark Erickson. Uh, so props to him. He's one of the core maintainers of Redux. Um, he's also done some recently, like yesterday, improvements to the static typing section of React Redux. Um, some more examples. Um, there's a new interface that was shipped, I think, this summer 
um, I'm trying to find it here. It's like, um, it's for inferring the connected props automatically. So this is with using the connect higher order component. But um, I always at least would have my connect function define the, redefine the props from Redux that would come through connect. So I would say, okay, this value is a string, but that's already defined in my app state. And so there's a helper called connected props that will pull those out of your connected higher order component. And you can take that as a type and pass it in as you'd like component props and then connected props or props from Redux. And that's super nice helper if you're using connect still. All right. I think it's time for new Twitter follow weeds. All right. I'll kick things off. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, WeWorkers Co. Uh, Twitter.com slash WeWorkers Co., which is a uh, kind of a collective action group uh, for uh, folks who work at WeWork. Um, so uh, you might have heard on the news that WeWork is, uh, you know, going through kind of a weird situation with an IPO that's on on pause and, you know, some concerns about whether they're able to make payroll. And um, so it's it's really, uh, you know, as, as a WeWork member, it's, you know, I'm kind of concerned and alarmed by this. Not so much because, um, you know, not so much for my, for my own workspace because, you know, whatever, like I'm a software engineer, I can work from wherever. But, you know, a lot of the people who work at WeWork, uh, you know, especially the folks who are running each of each of these offices, each of these buildings, like they're not Adam Newman. They're not, you know, they seem like very, very nice people. And, um, you know, they deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. And I don't necessarily feel, and I feel like a lot of people feel that like, that's not how we work corporate is uh, responding to these situations. So um, I wanted to uh, give these folks a shout out because they, uh, we, the WeWorkers Coalition is kind of talking about and publicizing um, a lot of things. Like they brought up the whole notion of how uh, basically WeWork fired all of their custodians and um, uh, gave them all uh, contract offers through now a subcontractor that WeWork is working with. Um, and there were a lot of kind of bad implications of that where um, folks would not receive their 401k contributions from WeWork for the year because their employment would terminate even if they accepted the offer at this new subcontractor. Um, so yeah, kind of a kind of a, a bad situation, but it's it's awesome that uh, you know folks who work for WeWork are. Um, kind of coming together and um, taking some action on this. Um, so I wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, next up is uh, Simone Geertz, a super cool person uh, who made a uh, a Tesla truck before it was cool. Um, so truckla. before, yeah, yeah, good old truckla. Oh my gosh, uh, what a great name. It's a pretty great name, right? Uh, so just, just uh, you know, Every every time you see that silly cyber truck, you can be like, "That's dumb." But the the real this is what cyber we could have had. <laughs> this is what we could have had a Model Three that was modified to be a super badass um, truck thing. And Simone is a cool person, and um, it does the like uh, a bunch of cool things with robots that are very silly, which I love. She's the self proclaimed queen of shitty robots. Yep, exactly. Give her a follow on YouTube as well. Great. Great channel. Totally. Uh, and then I also want to throw out there uh, twitter.com slash MWR native made with react native, um, which is kind of fun. Um, they tweet a bunch of things every once in a while about kind of some startling or cool things that are, that are uh, coming out of the react native community. It's, it's really fun because like they'll, they'll walk through and retweet another account with with some frequency that's like, oh, you know this really cool animation that's like tearing up the creative tech community. Well, look, I did that in in React Native. Uh, like, can like can it be done? So that's kind of fun. And those are my three new Twitter followees. Wonderful, nice. All right, I followed a few people, but um, I'll call out three here. First is Carolyn. Um, she does uh, front end development in based out in Ber. Berlin, I think, in Germany, um, but in America and live in there. Uh, she's got some some great blogs on 
dev.2, as well as tweets, and yeah, give her a follow. Next is Monica Lent, another American based in Germany. I think she's American, maybe not. I'm not quite sure. She does some other um, front-end style tweets as well. Um, and then last is Jason Webb. He's a developer advocate at Accessible360. He gave a talk Jason. at uh, JSMN in October uh, that was an awesome talk. So he's a good local Twin Cities developer advocate, which we don't have too many of, so pretty unique. No, Jason's super awesome. It was super great to have him come by JSMN. And um, he's uh, a, a really cool person to know in town. And uh, I know uh, if you are looking for you, the royal you, are looking for uh, uh, anyone to talk about web accessibility with, he's a great um, available person to talk to. How about you, Ryan? Yeah. I uh, see you followed you followed people. I did follow a few people. Uh, let me just click these buttons here. So uh, I followed a person that we talked about uh, many, many uh, Twitter followers ago, which is Ian Coldwater. I actually went to one of her talks here at uh, JavaScript Minnesota maybe a year and a half ago. And apparently I didn't follow her back then because that was too hard to do, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but it was recently KubeCon, and uh, Ian had been at KubeCon sharing all of the things. So that was pretty cool. She actually gave a talk there. No, Ian uh, Ian keynoted that. And yes. yeah, they're, they're a really great speaker. And um, Ian and I have been friends for, for, for quite some time now. Um, they were involved with the original junior devs group and stuff like that. So all, all sorts of all sorts of good things and it's so awesome i watched uh, a, l- a little bit of that uh of that talk i don't do the kubernetes thing yeah i don't so either admittedly I, I don't i don't understand anything that's going on and i try not i'm in my old age i try not to consume a ton of content that is like extremely um technical and things that uh i'm, I'm not uh you know excited about um can I just say, you said in my old age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he's you know. younger than us, so what will we do? <laughs> I'm, I'm at least, my, my mental age is at least 84, so we're, Oof. you know. But um, but I, I always love uh, seeing uh, an Ian Coldwater talk because, you know, I just remember having conversations with Ian early on, and now they're, like, keynoting um, all, all, the, all the big events, which is amazing and magnificent and i hope they stick around in minnesota because um it would be a loss uh, for us th- all it would be a major major yeah, loss i agree uh, if if they ever leave mm-hmm. so hi ian uh let's see who else uh i have followed brian don i met brian at um what was that thing that i went to um kotlin kotlin everywhere kotlin forever kotlin everywhere <laughs> Kotlin forever, uh, and um, uh, I I know I know Brian sort of also through Carl, who I know through work, and everybody knows Carl on Twitter. So hi Carl and hi Brian. Um, uh, Brian's actually working at a startup whose name I forgot, but it's like a farming startup, and I like farms, so that's cool. Uh, and then finally, um, I have one more, and it is Colin Lee, and. Um, Apparently he works at uh, Mozilla and he followed me and I followed him and uh, you know, cool stuff. Nice. What's this uh, tweet that you got here in the show notes? Yeah. So I was actually at the uh, U of M computer science 50th anniversary celebration. And um, there are some pictures here from the keynote speaker in the, in the, you know, kind of auditorium that everybody was in. And I was actually at this event and I saw, um, our, our our good friend here, Jamie, talk about um, sort of her impressions of where technology has been and where it's going. She was the keynote speaker for the event. She works at Microsoft's research division right now. And, you know, she's been in and out of higher education over the years and sort of worked in higher education research and higher education uh, developments but has also done that same kind of work, but out in the industry itself. So it was a really cool talk, and you can see all of my tweets from yesterday about all of those events. Right on. And I I put this in here because the reason I knew about this event and the reason I went to it is because of Twitter. And it's sort of uh, criminally underserved, I think. Like, only 500 people are following the account, and there's only 1,000 followers. And it's that's kind of a bummer because 
you know, Twitter is such a great medium for finding out stuff, especially stuff that your very technical college is a part of and doing. So mm. I, I'm a big fan. This is true. Twitter is pretty legit. Alrighty. I think that just about does it for our show this afternoon. It sure does. We'll have another episode at some point, probably within two months. We'll figure it out. I don't know. What, what Where does two months bring us to? Like uh, December? Like the middle of January. Oh, perfect. We'll definitely have a new one by January. I it hope might be so. 2020. <laughs> it might be 2020, but you know, then it'll be, yeah, I'm told hindsight is 2020. Uh, How many well, times are people going to make that joke? Well, a lot. And you know what? We'll just have to see. We will just have to see. Uh, but Brandon, where can we see you on the internet? Uh, you can find me just about anywhere, but mostly at coffee shops in and around downtown and uptown Minneapolis. Uh, on the internet, I am uh, Brandon underscore MN, most places, probably Twitter and Instagram uh, for the most part. Uh, I'll be at Serverless MN and JavaScript MN and probably Minneapolis Junior Devs uh, and various other things throughout history between now and the next podcast. So yeah, let's, let's catch up. It'll be fun. How about you, Brian? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, which has links to every uh, social platform that I'm basically on. Yeah, I'm also around Uptown, trying out coffee shops that I may or may not have been to. Um, yeah, since you mentioned meetups, I'm always at JSMN and React Minneapolis, and sometimes Node MN when they meet. That's me. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially at Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website, ryanrampersad.com. Uh, you can find the episode's show notes. This episode, episode 53 of Podkit at thenexus.tv slash pk53. And of course, you can follow us on Reddit and leave comments on this episode and many other episodes at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And of course, you can support us. You can support Brian and Brandon getting coffee in Uptown by going to patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. All right. Well, uh, see you uh, next month, maybe, or next year, maybe. Maybe. Maybe so. And by see you, I mean hear you? Hear you Either later. way. <laughs> have a good one. Either way, have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. Real quick thing before you go, it's almost time for the annual Project for Awesome, and the Nexus will be participating again. So what the heck is the Project for Awesome? Uh, the Project for Awesome is a community-driven annual fundraiser for charities that was started in 2007 by Hank and John Green. They do a 48-hour live stream gathering donations from the community, and then the donations are split between charities that are chosen by the community. So, how does the community choose? Well, online creators, such as yours truly, promote a charity that they think is doing important work and encourage their audience to go and vote for that charity on the Project for Awesome website. And we here at the Nexus chose... The Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now, to explain what the Electronic Frontier Foundation does, I think there's no better place to look than just to read from their mission statement. When freedoms in the networked world come under attack, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is the first line of defense. EFF broke new ground when it was founded in 1990, well before the internet was on most people's radar, and continues to confront cutting-edge issues defending free speech, privacy, innovation, and consumer rights today. From the beginning, EFF has championed the public interest in every critical battle affecting digital rights. EFF fights for freedom primarily in the courts, bringing and defending lawsuits even when that means taking on the U.S. government or large corporations. By mobilizing more than 50,000 concerned citizens through our action center, EFF beats back bad legislation. In addition to advising policymakers, EFF educates the press and public. As we were discussing which charity we wanted to support, all of the Nexus hosts were on board with choosing the EFF. Here are Ryan and Brian's thoughts on the subject. Hey everyone, this is Ryan. You might have heard technology is important these days. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's goal, its mission, is to raise funds for education, lobbying, and litigation in areas relating to digital speech, freedom, and privacy. All of those things are things that I believe in. And I hope you believe in those things too. My role in this is to help 
create great software to help society. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's role in this is to make sure technology stays great for society. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is one of the best examples that I can think of of an organization that continuously fights for the user. They center their goals around freedom of speech, privacy, creativity and innovation, transparency, international and security. They've helped create tools like HTTPS Everywhere and the Let's Encrypt cert bot, as well as taken issues to court against the federal government, the FCC, and the world's largest entertainment and electronics companies. The EFF website is quite extensive and is filled with guides, news, and other posts on all of the topics that they support. I think a digital rights foundation like the EFF is one of the most important groups that we can support to help every user of technology in today's digital world. All right, time for your calls to action. What do I want you to do? Uh, Number one, tune into the Project for Awesome live stream from noon December 6th to noon December 8th Eastern Time. Two, vote for the EFF on the Project for Awesome website. And three, donate some money directly to the EFF and or to the Project for Awesome. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one.